the objective of today's lecture is then to introduce you to haptics, haptics uh, to the forms of haptic feedback we have, which will serve as the basis for the for lecture 12, which is tell operation, where we implement the exact control system where we have a console that we move, and then you have the robot on the other end that follows the motion of that console. Has anybody heard of haptics? One here. Yeah? So most of you haven't heard of haptics before. So we'll see what types of haptic feedback, uh, types of haptic feedback exist, uh, tactile and force feedback, how do they work, and how we can model a simple haptic device. Let's imagine you're doing uh, training, in, uh, surgical training, in a virtual reality environment. So what you have here is two haptic devices, two of these joysticks that we use to control a tool in the virtual environment. So you move those tools and then they uh, move accordingly in the simulation. In a surgical console, the simulation will be replaced with the actual robot that would follow your motion. The idea is that you interact with the virtual environment, but these consoles, these, these haptic devices, the idea is that they will provide some sort of feedback to emulate the sensation of touching the tissue directly. So if your tool in the virtual environment touches the tissue, you should feel the stiffness of the tissue, you should feel some resistance to motion as you move the, these uh, consoles around. So that's pretty much the idea behind haptics. We, we let a user interact physically with a simulation. So how, how can we benefit from this? And once again, once you have a robotic system that has two parts, the robot operating on one end and the surgeon operating on the other end, the surgeon is no longer touching the tissue. And they typically use that information to assess, for example, the properties of the tissue to determine how much force they are exerting on the tissue and so on. If the link is gone, now you have you are passively moving something and what the robot is actually doing, the only feedback you have is the visual feedback. So you can't really tell how much force you're applying. So you could use one of these devices or the capability of generating forces to then restore that sense of touching the tissue to the surgeon. So the force on the, the environmental, the, the, the robot environmental uh, uh, environment would be then measured somehow, measured by a force sensor or other sensors. Right? So it determines the force you are exerting and then the force is translated back to the user on this side here. So that's here from this, uh, like the station. So in some case we can uh, do some dedication to here to like, like it feel more more force if we pass through some tissue. Exactly. So you could use this sort of haptic feedback in surgeries with a one-to-one -one force mapping. Or let's say you want to do micro-manipulation. The robots you have can reach an accuracy of 5 micrometers. Let's say you want to, to, ma to manipulate very small structures. And the force you would perceive if you do that by hand would probably be significant. You wouldn't, probably, wouldn't really feel anything if the forces are too small. But you could put a force sensor and amplify those forces substantially. And you could even have applications where you manipulate individual cells if your system is accurate enough. And you feel the forces of manipulating the cells that will help uh, guide the robot in that environment. So what are these devices used for? So two main applications. The first one is the simulation. Right? So the forces are generated by a model of the, the environment. Or for tele operation, where these forces are no longer modeled, they are measured, and then they are displayed, they are applied to the user as the user controls the robot. So here is one haptic device. This is the same model that is used to control the Canada arm in the International Space Station. We have uh, one of these. We have two of these coming in this year in the lab for, for research. These are, are uh, two, a pair of these is around $300,000. So these are really expensive uh, devices. The one that, that you are going to use are around 10K each. They're, they're still expensive, expensive tools, yeah. What's the, what's the big difference between this one and 
the one here. So the first difference is this is a seven off device. So you can have we can control all six degrees of freedom, and then you have a gripper. Right, and you can use the gripper to control a surgical tool, for example. Another big difference is that this one has gravity compensation, and what we call transparency of the device is is pretty high, meaning that if the robot is not touching anything, you shouldn't feel any forces, not even the dynamics of the device. Right? So we can emulate that with a device that is uh, programmed to compensate for, for those effects. On the other end, if you, if you hit something really hard, like a bone or something, you should also be able to feel those forces being applied here. So the range of impedances this device has to, to, to cover is, is very wide. Right? So that's one of the reasons um, they cost so much. So whenever we interact through this teleoperation system, either on a virtual or physical environment, our sense of touching the environment is gone. And they use a sense of touch for most of these tasks, especially in surgery. So here are a few examples. If you take an object, we can use a sense of touch to detect texture when you slide your fingers on it, pressure, we're just pressing on it, a static contact for temperature, weight, uh, shape and volume, and uh, contour um, of the, uh, and, and shape of the device of the object. So if this, you can imagine that if this, all this information is gone when you manipulate um, a tissue remotely, the only feedback you have is, is, is the image. So there's a lot, uh, the, the chances that are going to damage the tissue are a lot high. Right. So the, the, the problem exists, the solution is still doesn't. The, all the haptic, the uh, surgical robotics console in the, in the in available in the market today and the ones that are used in clinics they don't have any form of haptic feedback so let's just start with uh, an, an application in a virtual environment so here we have this virtual environment you guys probably played with virtual reality before it's quite fun you manipulate objects and do everything but you don't feel any objects right? you don't feel what you are doing and you can tell that by not feeling anything your accuracy in doing a certain task is, is a bit random right? because the only feedback you have is the visual feedback and it's not very intuitive when you expect for example let's say you would grab a chair you would expect that weight right that shape to be there and if it's not then your visual feedback is the only thing you 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 have so the sense of touch in the virtual simulation is gone and has a pretty good gives you a pretty good motivation to use the haptic devices with the haptic feedback to then restore this sense of touch. So here is a professional surgery simulator. <laughs> <laughs> That's how surgeons train to, to operate. Who, who has uh, played this before? I kill the patient every single yeah. time. Even yeah, yeah. Every time I play to the patient, uh, it's bleeding to death, and then nothing to do there. Uh, so this is a would be a fun one to have some some feedbacks. So you could break the ribs and then feel them breaking apart, right? But they it's not there. So you just hit it and then you, whatever uh, comes out of it. Uh, who does that has never seen this picture before? So this is a game in virtual reality. You all guys, uh, you all play this, right? Yeah, quite quite fun. Right? Yeah, that's a. Uh, Okay, so this would be quite interesting. Imagine that this, this hammer, this hammer here will be connected to that haptic device. So you now have to feel the weight of hitting the patient, not hitting the patient, or <laughs> operating on the patient, right? Or doing it properly and playing the game properly, not just trying to destroy the operating room and kill the patient as fast as you want. So that's the idea. So how do we go about that recreating this sense of touch? We have two ways. The first one is a tactile feedback. The other one is a kinesthetic feedback. So we can, we can split the way we would feel these forces into two. The first one is the cutaneous receptor uh, that are embedded in the, um, in the skin. And the second one are those that are in the muscles. So for the first one, we would feel from them, we would feel the sense of touch, the tactile feedback, in the same way that they have on, on our phones. When you type something, you have a little vibration that it gives you a good feedback as to uh, did you actually type it or, or not. And then the second one will now give you the idea of force 
if you played um, a video game with uh, like a dri driving uh, simulator, you know, so some of these, these steering wheels have haptic feedback, right? So that would fall in the second category or a, of kinesthetic perception where these sensors, or they come from the sensors and they are located in the muscles rather than the skin. So you could use both of them, one to recreate the sense of touching, the other one recreating the forces that it would perceive from interacting with a given environment. So there are three main categories of haptic devices. So those are the devices built to emulate these types of uh, sensations. The first one is the touchable, which is the same as you have in your cell phone. You touch it, you feel the forces. You, feel, feel, you don't feel the force, you feel some sort of vibration, some sort of feedback. Could also be temperature, could also fall in that category. The second one is a crustable feedback uh, system that you hold and, um, and interact with, the, with objects in that environment, like in the first one here. And the, the, the middle one is the wearable device. Something, for example, a glove that you put and then uh, when you touch something in the environment, Put it on and then you feel vibrations or something right some sort of um, wearable feedback or let's say uh, some sort of uh, exoskeleton arm that you would wear and then control something like in the, in the avatar movie for example right but then you would receive uh, perceive the, the feedback from uh, the, the robot that you are controlling right so these can then emulate temperature texture uh, vibration in force you, during interaction with a virtual environment or also during interaction with a tele-operated or remotely controlled environment. Right? The robot could be uh, in Europe and could be controlling the robot from here provided that there is uh, the, the delay communication delay is small enough. So let's go over these categories. The first one is the um, Touchable haptic devices, for example, in a cell phone, you, you, when you type, you get some sort of feedback to confirm your action, and that is quite handy. Once you have it, it's hard to go back and imagine doing the same thing without that a little little vibration. So how does that work? Are there different forms? This is the the engine that is used in the iPhones, but it, it's there are many versions of it, but the principle is the same. There is a mass, and the mass vibrates. Uh, the mass vibrates at a, a resonates at a frequency and vibrates. There are also piezoelectric actuators that will do the same in a smaller package. But here is a, the idea: the, the, this is a motor with a mass that is not is rotating on an axis that is not centered, right? So as it rotates, then it creates that a little vibration. Here we have a mass inside with coils, and then they just go up and down. So these things here you can buy them for like a few dollars each. And then um, those who play video games are probably uh, know what I'm talking about right? when it comes to uh, the newer versions of uh, video games. Okay, so pretty easy to understand. So one thing that um, uh, we could do with those, and there's some research, is to emulate texture with these vibrations. Because what is the perception of texture if not simply putting your hand on something and perceiving the vibrations that you create by sliding your hand? on those that are given frequency. So if you can detect that a frequency and you can detect the position of the finger, perhaps as you slide your finger on a virtual surf, uh, surface, you could potentially feel the texture of whatever you're trying to emulate under it. Right? You can control, control it properly. The main limitation of doing this with tablets today or with an iPhone is that it has only one actuator and when it vibrates, the whole thing vibrates. Right? But there is, new, there is now new technology and research that is able to concentrate the vibration on your fingertip only. Even if you have multiple fingers on the screen, uh, the, is able, we can concentrate these vibrations from different actuators using like propagation of waves and uh, um, interference of waves so that it will only vibrate one finger at a time. So you can imagine this, uh, for example, in what is shown here, you're buying clothing online and then you want to feel the texture and know how, a product, uh, how good the feedback would be but it will give you a, an, an indication. Right. The second one is the uh, still in, the, in this category is the touchable haptic devices. This was a capstone design project from last year. 
the idea was that when you interact with the simulation, especially when you want to have, have a scalpel there trying to cut through a tissue, you have no feedback at all. Right? So the only way to have feedback if it would be, for example, to get that a big haptic device from the beginning there that was quite expensive, make that control the scalpel. But now, now you are holding that whole structure just to control this little thing, and you are attached to a pixel frame. So what you're trying to solve here was, um, what if we just create a tool that will give you the, that is handheld and that will give you some similar sort of feedback? So what uh, the students proposed here was um, to add grooves to this tool and put a, 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 a an actuator under it that it would stretch your skin the, the, at the, the uh, fingertip. And when you stretch the skin in a particular way, that it feels like a force or a little torque. So when you press, uh, for example, when you go down here and you go against the tissue, then this, the, the fingertips are moved slightly, and then um, you can feel what the environment is, is uh, what you're touching in the environment, which is exactly what Odin is doing in his capstan project is the taking this to the, the next next level. All right, so redesigning the actuators, refining the haptic feedback and the simulation. So the next one is the wearable device. And here we can see an idea. Now we could use this giant gloves here that look quite complicated and then maybe put actuators on your fingers and when you you reach an object, it will stop you from moving, it will prevent you from moving further. So that would give you the sensation of touching something in that environment. All right. uh, look how many cables go in there. So that's not really very, it's not very, I think, natural. All right. So you are solving a problem, you're probably creating a new one, which is now you have to wear all these equipment. But that's the idea behind wearable haptic devices. Here is um, another one that is a bit simpler. Instead of forces, it vibrates. So they have actuators in your fingers. Uh, they vibrate if you touch something and they can also press, um, basically uh, compress around, uh, apply pressure around your fingers uh, when you touch something. All right. All right. So this was a startup. I don't know if this actually ever got into production. Here's another one, so the video game enthusiasts would probably uh, like this. So this uh, we have actuators in this vest, and then uh, if you're do, doing like a uh, shooting game or something, you can feel where it's coming from, and, um, and I don't know if I would personally enjoy that, but <laughs> that, that is a market for it, apparently. So, so each of these are actuators that would vibrate and would be strong enough to emulate the sensation of uh, interacting uh, in that environment, playing that environment. Why not? And then this, the third category is the kinesthetic haptic devices and that's the one that we would be most interested in because that's the one we can use for uh, emulating forces during simulation uh, in surgical training or during teleoperated surgery. Here is one example. This is a device that we have in the lab and is used for um, percutaneous nephrolithotomy training. Remember that procedure we saw in the, one of the past lectures? It's the same idea here. So what you see in the image is what the user is seeing in the virtual reality using the, the goggles. And the user is controlling a needle that you can't see here used holding, by holding the tip of the, the robot. So as you move it, you see the, the needle moving as well. And as soon as you touch the tissue, you will feel the force of the needle interacting with tissue. If you touch a bone, you will feel that as well. Right? So if you guys wanted to try this, uh, just let Alec know and come to, to the lab. He can give you a, a demo. Right? Just ask him. He's doing a co-op with the company now, and uh, he can he can give you a give you a demo here. All right. So where uh, wh why am I talking about all these? Well, because you could potentially use these things in robotic surgery, in simulation, or in actual surgery. So now that's the to use these devices as a passive tool. That's fine, but the only feedback we have is the visual feedback from the cameras or we could somehow try to use them to 
emulate the forces that the robots are applying to the tissue. For now, and in the labs, we're going to use them as passive devices. So this is basically the console you hold, and then the robots will follow your motion according to the teleoperation scheme that you put in place. It's up to you to choose. Let me see if we have any updates from Alec. Not yet. All right, so here are a few... Uh, a few haptic devices available in the market going from $300 to uh, $150,000 per, per device right, from the top to the bottom. Um, so what makes them expensive? Well, the number of degrees of freedom, the impedance range they can provide because ideally, as I said, there are two extreme scenarios. One scenario where you hold it but you don't even feel the inertia or anything. Right? So like you were operating um, in free space and then the next extreme scenario is you touch something that is quite rigid and you, should, you shouldn't be able to go in that, uh, that environment right? it should, should prevent you from moving into it and it's not a, a, a simple a simple control problem it's not easy to make sure that to ensure that we have such a wide stability range so that's what really defines the uh, the the, um, the the price and the quality of these devices. So yours, the one you're going to go, go in the lab, using the lab falls around here. Oh, it's a decent decent trade off. Right? So that one, the, the first one is around three hundred dollars. I have two of those in the lab, where they're more, mostly for gaming. They're not very good. The the second one is around three thousand. It's a six degrees of freedom, but only three degrees of freedom has. Um, have haptic feedback and then yours would come there and then from there on is on the thirty thousand dollar range and here fifty seventy hundred hundred and fifty around on that range. So these are quite quite expensive uh, systems but you'll see they are uh, they are fun to work with. Hmm I had pictures here that are not showing. Let's see if I can show them directly from from the uh, Google app. One second. For some reason, this uh, PDF expert thing is. Um, is not. It doesn't display all the pictures at times. Okay, so oops. So I just want to show you the system. I need the pictures. Yeah, that's the same thing. That makes my, my, my picture quite useless. Hmm? On Brightspace. Can I download it? Maybe I'll try to. Is the same thing? Show it directly in the in the browser. Oh right. That works. Yeah, we have the image. Okay, so let me uh. Let me well, we have the image. Right. What can I do? Uh, I don't want to log in on Brightspace right now. What here can be used for this? Let's see if this is better. Come on, that doesn't work. All right, but anyway, so we'll go. We'll do without it. You have your 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 copy there. You can follow from from it, right? So the the idea is that a haptic interface will have two two ends: it's the user end and then the controller end. So for the haptic device, it should be in the middle here. All right, so that's the device right there. The haptic device is uh, 
on, on the right side here we have the controller and on the uh, this side we have the operator. So how do we actually work with this? Well, first let's just start with the second part there. We have what we, we can measure the state of the haptic device. We can measure, for example, the position of the end effector or the position of individual joints. Use the forward kinematics, find the position of the tooltip. That position of the tooltip goes into a virtual sim reality simulation. All right. That detects and it calculates the forces that we want to display to the user. So these forces will come back. We have actuators such as motors here. And then the motors apply force to the user back to the haptic device. Right. Uh, yours is showing that what uh, software you're using. Oh, this is just the price page. Oh, okay. So it's the buy price page. Sorry. So from this end, then from the user, what do we see? Well, we, to the, we first need to detect that of those forces that are being applied. So those are through the receptors that we uh, talked about later, through the skin or through the, the, um, the muscles. Then they are processed in the brain. The brain sends commands to the muscle and they will adjust our, um, our input accordingly. All right, so it's a two way, to, to, uh, there are two loops operating in, in, in parallel to make sure that the forces are applied. So the input, our input to the system is the displacement and we perceive back the forces. Right. On the other end there, we have uh, the input to the virtual environment is the position and then the output is the force generated. Remember that uh, uh, example of the surgical simulator, uh, the, the input to the simulation would be the position of the hammer that is, the that is now the position of the haptic device and then there is a physics based model that will tell us how much force we should display to the user if you hit something with that hammer in the environment. Okay, I think I have to log into Brightspace. Okay, so it's not ideal, but it does the job. All right, so let's uh, uh, dig a little more into the control scheme of these haptic devices. So back to our example there, we have the haptic device that is now controlling that a hammer. We have the virtual environment that now takes a physics-based model of what's going on in here and then calculates the desired state. In this case, the desired could be the desired position of the haptic device or could be the desired force of the haptic device. From the haptic device itself, we know its current state. For example, the haptic device is not producing any force, but the environment wants it to produce some force. Or the haptic device is in position X and the virtual environment determines that the haptic device is to be in position Y. Right, that's the difference in the state, the current state, and the state determined by the environment. We compare them, we create an error here, and we send that to the haptic controller. That could be simply a PID controller or something controlling the position of the haptic device or the uh, force that it wanted to apply. And that goes to the haptic device itself. Right? So now what makes the current state of the haptic device change and not necessarily match the desired one. Well, what the user applies to it. So the user is interacting with the haptic device, is applying a force, is moving it around, right? And then by moving it around, we change the current state, we change the forces in the environment, and the system then um, uh, evolves until it settles in a different point. How do we get feedback from all this? Well, we have feedback from the forces we get, but also the visual feedback that it goes to the brain, and then from there we uh, determine the motion commands uh, we want to, to, to give to the device. Right. So that's, a, um, you see here a lot of different feedback loops, as you remember from 36, 3610 and 3600, right. but it's essentially a position or force control when it comes to the, 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 the um, the haptic device and the magnitude of that force or position is coming from the virtual environment. So we have two types of these haptic devices. The first one is what we call the impedance-based control haptic devices. They take in a position and they apply a force. 
we give the position of the hammer, for example, and then the position of the hammer, uh, let's say, is, is inside a bone, which shouldn't be. Now, what's the, the, uh, the environment going to tell you? It's going to tell you they have to apply a force to take it out of it, right? because physically it shouldn't be in that part of the environment. So a force comes back and the force is applied to the, um, the user. Imagine just touching something, right? You, you apply a displacement, you get a force back. That's how the, the haptic device is controlled. The, but it could do the other way around. We could apply a force instead of a displacement and then apply a position back. Apply a position doesn't mean anything, but controlling the position, perhaps that's a better term. Uh, the haptic device will try to control its position. So instead of a impedance, we now look at the admittance of the environment, which is simply the opposite of the impedance. So what is the difference? Well, the difference is that in the first case there, we have to measure position, we apply forces. The second one, we have to measure the forces the user is applying to the haptic device. And that's where it starts to get complicated because they are... Uh, force sensors are quite expensive. A six dot force sensor, relatively a good one, is around ten thousand dollars. So those uh, add a lot more to the, the cost of these devices. And also, we want the device to have as uh, a mi the minimum possible mass in it. So we don't want to attach anything to it because by attaching too much weight, then you are creating inertia and friction that don't belong to the simulation or to the teleoperated environment. You're basically just dealing with the mass of the haptic device itself, which should be minimized. Right? So what are the components then of these haptic systems? By, by now you, you, you get it, we have basically two, well, the, the haptic device itself and then three main parts, regardless of which type of haptic device we are using. So the first one is probably the more important one here is the haptic rendering part. From the simulation, we get the forces we want to apply. Right? So thinking about the, um, the example with the, the, the hammer and the, the simulation, we have to detect when you are in contact with a, a surface, then have a physics-based model to give you the force response we want from that. Go th give that to a control system that then makes the haptic device apply the amount of force you want. So the response here is the displacement. Displacement goes to a simulation engine. Simulation engine is basically the virtual rendering of the, the, that simulation and it goes to the uh, graphics uh, engine and then displays that to the user. If we were using a robotic system, a teleoperated robotic system, what would change here? simulation or the visual. simulation exactly the simulation will be gone and instead of the simulation we have the actual surgical site and we would be measuring these forces as a robot interacts with the surrounding environment okay I think this one should display from now on let me check Yeah, this is all messed up. That's really unfortunate. Okay, so here is the simplest structure, and this also applies to the one you have in the lab. The simplest structure of the haptic device itself. And this is a impedance controlled haptic device. So we have an act, uh, the handle that is connected to actuators. They have some sort of kinematics. This one here is only one dot. It's just a bar that you move in and out. There is an actuator around that bar that can provide motion in both directions. And then a displacement sensor that measures the position. So we start by measuring the displacement. The displacement is typically measured uh, in a discrete fashion, but it could be measured in an analog fashion, so it has to be converted to a digital signal first, and then it goes to the program. The program is the simulation, in this case, or the surgical site that comes out as 
a, uh, a desired force that it goes back to the actuator. Right? It's as simple, simple as that. So the ideal haptic device, we, we always say this, it would have no friction and no mass. Why is that? Because then you wouldn't feel anything, you wouldn't feel the, the, um, the forces that are come from interacting with a mass and uh, uh, or interacting with an object that is not part of the simulation. The simulation. Uh, in simulation. It's just the physics of the device itself. So here is a very simple implementation. Let's see if that helps understanding how these things work. This is the most simple implementation you can think of. So you have the same haptic device here and you want to simulate a virtual wall. So it's a wall and you cannot penetrate in that wall. We are controlling that a red dot. I'm going to call that a, an avatar. And this is a 2D simulation and you have the position of the defector that, that they're in the simulation that's given by XE and YE. So you move the bar, you move that dot in the, in the plane. So if you want this to be a virtual wall, that means that as soon as you touch the wall, there must be a force that pushes you away from it. All right, so we can say that our controller here is very simple. If the wall is at XW and we know the X position of the ball, which is XE, we can say that uh, with respect to this coordinate frame, if XE is smaller than XW, then the desired force is zero, so we can move it freely. And if XE is greater than XY, then what's the force? One minus FA, yeah. Or we can make something, this look like a spring. For example, we could say that uh, FA is a constant times the difference between XW and XE. So if the more you penetrate into the wall, the greater the force that it pushes you away from it. Right? So if this stiffness constant is too small, then this will feel like a spring. As soon as you touch that wall, you feel a spring force taking you back. So what's the ideal value of that stiffness? It's in infinite. All right, because as soon as you touch it, you cannot go further in. What is the problem? Remember from 3600 or 3610, when it comes to very high control gains. Overshoot. Overshoot, but more, more critically, root locus, does that ring a bell? The system may become unstable. 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 And that's exactly what is going to happen here. Let's say I go against the wall, so force is zero, and now I touch the wall. As soon as I touch the wall, the controller says, well, the force, force. There, there must be an infinite force that way. So it applies a force that way, and then you come out. Then the force goes to zero, because it's left, and you go back in. And then you start to vibrate around the, the wall. All right. So in a scenario here, let's say you're like pushing against the wall, would you also have another equation for like if you were to push past that wall? You would have, so in the, that's a good question. In the, the context of surgery, there is no model because you would be measuring the force directly, right? But we could add an extra layer. Let's say I want the robot to operate within this small cube. If the operator makes the robot go beyond that, then there is a virtual fixture, we call that, that it will not let the robot get out. It will constrain the robot inside. So that way, yes, then we would, we would need to specify the value of that, but that it could add, add a, is a additional guidance that it will make sure that the robot only operates within a certain region, and anything that goes beyond that will make the robot come back in. Alright, All right, so there is this problem of instability then. If, if the gain is too high, the system will vibrate and oscillate around that point. So what it could do to make this a bit easier. You remember the effect of damping and the stability of closed loop control system? Damping has a stabilizing effect because it creates exponentials right, that dissipate energy. Does that ring a bell from 3610 or should you? Yeah? We can take it again if that doesn't. <laughs> no? Or 3600. Alright, so the energy dissipation in the form of exponential components will um, 
have a stabilizing effect in the system. So what it could do, so I didn't have my, uh, my stylus to write before, but this is what I was going to write. The stiffness constant times the penetration in the wall. Right? And K is a constant that we can, we, can, uh, we can choose. We can add another variable here that is proportional now to the speed. Right? And that will help stabilize the system when it goes. <clears throat> In the wall, the this works pretty much like a PD controller, isn't it? Because right? if you only have position, the greater the error, the greater the force. Look, sounds like proportional controller. If we add now the derivative of speed, which is the derivative of this error, isn't that the derivative part, right? So this could be a seen as a PD controller where K is the P part, B is the D part. Okay, so Alec sent me a message saying, I don't think this is going to work, so it's probably not coming. Um, but uh, he can show that to you in the lab. And you're going to work with it anyways uh, next week, uh, the week after the reading week, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what, uh, how that feels like. Okay, so the idea is always the same. You're controlling this avatar in the virtual environment. If you go in the wall, you, we exert a force here to take you out of it. So we can simulate this from this constant K. We can simulate different materials. They're basically just changing the ratio between force and displacement, which is the stiffness, in other words, of the virtual environment. Right? So the ideal stiffness of a virtual wall would be a curve that is pretty much vertical. As soon as you touch the wall, it will take you out of it. Right? But a soft materials can also be simulated uh, with it. So here is an interesting um, idea for your design project if you want to implement some sort of visual uh, haptic feedback in simulation. In MATLAB you could uh, design your own virtual environment that is related to some sort of surgical training and then go from, from there. So let's uh, complicate things a little bit and just do a very simple simulation. So the simulation here is we want to simulate a sphere. Or in this case, we're going to limit to a 2D to make things simple. It's just a circle. So we want the simulation to always keep the, the um, end effector either inside or outside of that circle. We want to create forces that will keep you inside or outside of that. So we measure the position of the haptic device. That gives the position of the end effector. <coughs> Depending on where the end effector is, we determine the force, and then the force is applied to the device. So what's the utility of that in the context of robotic surgery? The constraint. Right? You want the surgeon, for example, to operate only within that circle, or only outside of that circle if that circle represents a sensitive structure, for example. And just operate around it, and as soon as you approach that circle, the robot will be moved away from it and then you don't damage those sensitive structures. So let's uh, make a few assumptions and this is a circle here but it could be any form, right? Let's make a few, a few assumptions. The circle is positioned at point O in this X and Y frame. It has a radius of R. So the circle has coordinates X, O and Y, O and the end effector here has coordinates X, P and Y, P in the vector P. How do we determine if the end effector is inside or outside of the circle? How could we do that? Hmm? The length of what? In the factor with respect to the origin. Yeah, yeah, we're getting there. But more, more precisely, or any other ways to do that? Any other ideas? We could see if the end effector. So if let's say if the distance between point P and O is greater than R, is the end effector in and out? 
is out. Okay, if the distance between P and O, the Euclidean distance between P and O is smaller than R, then P is in the circle. How do you calculate that Euclidean distance? So the, the distance is P minus O, right? Or the magnitude of P minus O. How do you calculate the Euclidean distance between N factor and O? x minus x is squared plus y minus y squared square root the whole the whole thing let me give this an, uh, one last try I'm a bit disappointed I should have tested this before come okay these ones are working everything is messed up that's really annoying they even vector form this always worked anyways Okay, so what we have to do is to determine that a distance between the two and the distance is a vector, P minus O. Now we can now calculate the, the Euclidean distance between P and O by simply taking the magnitude of D up to here at this point. Are we, are we good? Uh, which is simply that. Right? And the Euclidean distance is always a, scale, a positive scalar number. Right? So if D is greater than R, we are outside of the circle. If this is smaller than R, then you are inside of that circle. Right? And you can use the same idea as before. Let's say we want the end factor to stay inside the circle. So the, uh, we can make a force point inwards and make that force proportional to how much outside, of, how far outside of the circle you are. Or the other way, if you want this to, the avatar to stay outside of the circle, we make the force coming outwards, and you make that proportional to the penetration of the end factor in the circle. All right, so that, step one, we determine if we were in or, not, or out. And in step two, now let's calculate these forces. So here we want the avatar to stay always outside of the circle. So as soon as it goes in, we need a force that moves you out. In which direction is that force? Yes, but it, what, what is the, in which way should that point? It should point outside of the circle, but what's the line that defines the direction? Is the line of D, is the line of F of P minus O, isn't it? Does that make sense? Yeah? All right, so if you are approaching, the circle is here, that's O, and you're here, you want the force to point this way if you approach over there, even if you go from this side, uh, we need the force to, uh, we can make the assumption that the force will go that way. Always normal to the tangent of the circle outside. Now there are better ways to do this because if you come from the side here, right, so you, you would be a little strange, but that, that should still work. So how do you define the direction of the forces? Well, the direction of the forces is simply the unit vector along D, D is the distance between P and O. So if we divide the vector distance by its magnitude, which is D, then you have a unit vector. The unit vector has two components and is now giving us the direction of the forces in um, the direction of the forces in X and Y that it will make the force always point outwards like that. So this is a unit vector and this is a scalar. This is the penetration and this is a unit vector. So what is the vec what is vector h? It's the difference between uh, point P and the outer. Like. Yes, that's d minus r, yeah. right? When you multiply that by u, we create a vector, and then that vector is basically telling you telling you the components of the penetration in the circle. Does that make sense? Sort of. So that, let's say you are, we are over here, and that's O. The unit vector is pointing that way. Right? So it has components on X and on Y. It's a unit vector, right? So uh, 
if you add the, 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 the together here, you have to get 1. We multiply that by d minus r, which is the penetration in the wall. All right, so we are now scaling this that way and this this way, and then adding, creating a force vector like that. So the unit vector is basically giving us the direction of x and y. But it's also, sorry, not the direction of x and y. It's giving us the components of the penetration in x and y that is, that are scaled by how much the unit factor is in the, the, the circle. Does that make sense? All right. And in that way, then, um, we can, as soon as you touch the, the circle, you should feel a force uh, taking you out of it. Now, how can you define the force? Well, we have a vector of forces. Uh, the vector of forces is that. We can scale this by k, a constant that we, that we can choose. And now we have here a force that it gives the uh, that is given by scaling this vector of displacement into the, uh, the circle by a certain amount k. So if, you, if d is greater than r, what's the force? Zero. If d is greater than r, the distance between the end effector and the origin is greater than the radius of the circle. We are outside. That's zero. And if you're now inside, then it is um, one. All right. So you will program this with the haptic device yourselves in lab so just, just to clarify, the vector penetration is not based on the reaction force. Not yet. It basically, the reaction force is what we, what we do is it, we get a vector that gives us the components of penetration in y and x. That's a vector like that, right? We know that that vector is normal to the tangent of the circle. And um, at, at, at the entry point, and then. When you take this vector and multiply by the scalar k, that becomes the force. So k just gives you a more freedom to choose how aggressive you want the controller to be. Right? So if k is too small, then you probably go all the way in the middle of the circle until you feel something. But if k is very high, then as soon as you enter the circle, you have a force pushing you out. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. This one? Yes. Because if d is greater than r, then the end factor is outside of the circle. And okay. we want no I, force. I understand that. Yeah. Just, I mean, the calculation, how, how could you, like, if you do... There is no calculation. We are assigning it to be zero. Okay. Because we are saying if you are outside of the circle, you should move freely. So it's uh, like a constraint, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then k becomes the stiffness constant that we can choose. All right, so when it comes to your labs, what are you going to be doing? We have this device here. You saw this in the first lab briefly. Uh, we have a two-doff device, and this two-doff device uh, has this uh, closed kinematic chain. So our uh, DH parameters would have to be revised a little bit to use with these, but we will give you the forward and inverse kinematics of this device. I don't have to worry about that. It will be given to you. The way it works is have three dots, so two here, and then one at the base, so we can pivot around. So you end up with three degrees of freedom, which will pose an interesting technical challenge because the robot has six degrees of freedom. So now, how do you go from a three dot to a six dot problem? Right. You'll deal with that in lab eight. Though this week's lab, some of you already worked with the constraint point in your space. All right? So that's another, another way. We are basically telling the robot to take care of orientation while I take care of position using the haptic device to control the tip of the robot 
at a given orientation so that it passes through a certain point in space, for example. So we can decouple the sixth off problem into two 3D problems. One, uh, the position can be controlled by this, and then the orientation is controlled uh, by the robot itself, the way you program it. Yeah. So when it's decoupled, the haptics only control the first three joints? Up, no, not the three joints. It controls the 3D Cartesian position of the tooltip. So let's say, um, for example, uh, I want uh, this is the point I want to go to, but there's a constraint here saying I want to pass through that point. So what you do is that you go through that, that point, and then from now on, you can move inside this space so long as you pass through that point. Right? So the position of my hand is given by this. So you can move it around, and then my hand will just follow. But let's say I want to go to this point, I have to pass through this point. That means that the orientation, when I go there, is fixed. So then you can let the controller take care of that constraint point. Right. So that's the objective of lab, uh, lab 7 and, and 8. Okay, so it's a 3 DOF device, and here is the mechanism that we, we are basically using. We have two motors and two position sensors at the base. So these, these overlap, right? they are in the same way, just split them apart here for, for clarity. So you have a motor and a, a, a position sensor. We measure the position of these two, and these two uh, other angles here are dependent on the first two angles. So you move the end effector around and then this whole thing pivots around this axis. Right? So it can come out of the page like that and pivot like that. Right? So theta 1 and 4 are the ones that I have that, and 5 are the degrees of freedom that are actuated that you can feel some force feedback from. And then the other ones are uh, dependent on them. And then you can attach a little um, pen-like tool at the tip but that doesn't have any feedback. It's just a passive, passive device. Okay, so this will be your uh, activity in lab, uh, coming lab, the lab six after the reading week. It will simulate this circle. I think the the lab is actually a sphere. We'll simulate a sphere, and implement all these virtual environment stuff um, yourself. Okay, so how? Um, a little more on how these this work. Typically, we use a DC motor, and DC motors, small DC motors, have a small torque. So you somehow have to amplify that torque to get something strong enough. We never used gears in haptic devices. If you use gears, the problem is that the system becomes non-back drivable. You know what that means? The macadamic, for example, if you move, it, try to move it back, it doesn't move. It can only move in one way. But you cannot manually when it's turned off most of the degrees of freedom, you cannot move it by hand, right, because of the gears uh, uh, between the motor and the end factor. So instead, we use this sort of capstan transmission. So you have the motor up here, and you have cables, and the cables are um, uh, go around the, the transmission like that. So you can move the end factor freely back and forth, and you can also perceive the forces. Another advantage of this is there are no teeth in the gear, there are no gears, so you wouldn't feel the transition between the gears, which could potentially destroy the perception of the environment you're interacting with. Yeah. Well, wouldn't the cables have slack or time? Like so the cables are typi typical, at the, the very end here, they have springs that it will keep them tensioned. Oh, okay, so yeah. it keeps it. Yeah. So, it does, so even when it starts wearing out, the spring will keep it tensioned constantly? Yeah, then at one point you have to yeah. replace it. Uh, and then the robot, it, the, the motor itself will probably have a position encoder attached to it. It's an incremental encoder. It will give you measurement of position, and then you can apply the force. So each joint of the robot will have a, a, one of these uh, combos of capstan transmission, DC motor, and then the position sensor. <coughs> right. 